So again, uh, good morning. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be with you here today. And I, I expressly want to shout out Peter, who's with us, who sort of made the connection. Um, uh, I work with Peter uh, in my capacity as a lecturer at the University of Torino. Uh, and that program, that master's program, is about the use of information and communication technologies for development, ICT for D. Um, but the piece of that program that I that I oversee uh, is oriented around design. And so Peter and I talked a little bit about what does it look like to introduce uh, more and more folks to the application of design to development and humanitarian challenges. And here's uh, our, our topic effectively for today. Uh, I do want to note before I get started. So. It it's, was quite an early morning for me. Um, I have an eight month old. Uh, and so my wife is presently asleep with my eight month old, rightfully so. I also have a three and a half year old and I am monitoring my monitor of my three and a half year old. So if he wakes up before my eight month old wakes up, I have to take two minutes and run upstairs and go help orient him because he's going to wonder where his dad is. But barring that, uh, we're going to spend about 90 minutes together today with a few interludes, hopefully some interesting interludes, um, talking about this, exactly this topic. And, and what again is that topic? That topic is this. Um, will someone please, I, I thought back to the start of my sort of journey with design thinking, and I realized that my journey of design doing started several years after my introduction to the concept of design thinking. And it actually started when someone, uh, 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 Robert Fabricant, who previously worked for Frog Design, now started Delver Design, sat me down and finally told me what design thinking actually was. This is about 12 years ago. Because I heard the term, as you may have heard the term, tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of times. People tossed it around very casually. It was a catch-all for wearing a skinny tie sitting on a beanbag chair and throwing sticky notes up on the wall. And I thought there's gotta be more to it than this because I've seen the ways in which it can be very powerful uh, when designing and, and, and implementing interventions. Um, and I'd also seen the ways in which it had been very much instrumentalized again to make folks feel good about sitting around on beanbag chairs and putting sticky notes up on the wall. So again, I wondered, Will someone please finally tell me what design thinking actually is? And I, I hope to do that uh, for you and with you here today. And not just that, but also maybe why we should care. A little bit of why we might care. Uh, what, what is it good for? What does it help us do? Uh, where does it fit into our vital work? Um, and how can it augment uh, the way we presently do things? So a bit about me. Um, I'm Josh. I uh, spent several years at UNICEF uh, running UNICEF's Innovations Lab. I went later on to CARE International to found and lead their research and design team, which uh, was an innovation services team for the global footprint of the organization. Um, presently, I'm a senior director and chief of staff at a domestic organization in the US called Leadership for Educational Equity. We're a hybrid organization, sort of um, hybrid nonprofit and political organization that seeks to uh, get folks elected who are going to put children and specifically education at the center of their uh, legislative agendas. Um, I left, I took a break, if you will, from development after 2016 and the birth of my son. It was the same year that we had an election in the US and I wanted to come back and kind of help fight the fight here a little bit. Um, but I've also run a consulting practice uh, which continues to do work in development and humanitarian in the development humanitarian space that's called very green grass um, and if you want to get in touch with me you can either find me at josh at verygreengrass.com uh, send me an email or you can always tweet at me at that josh harvey probably the most important thing i ride tractors i have my tractor i love riding my tractor that's my hobby and i'm a dad um, and this right here this photo on the left you might imagine uh, I'm not the little one. That's my son, Atticus. That actually, that picture was taken after I had just gotten back from three weeks uh, away uh, in, in um, uh, where was I? Patna in India. Uh, and when I got back, 
uh, he, this was the, the first time that he ran toward me to hug me. And so I'd like to share this picture with everyone. And again, just to say, um, my consulting practice uh, is, is very green grass. And that's just sort of like the container for a lot of uh, consulting work that I do for UN, international organizations, governments, uh, social enterprises, uh, NGOs, etc. So maybe the best way to learn what design is, is to do some of it, right? We're all, I would imagine most of us on this call have designed something in the sense of we have created something. We are called upon to um, create entire interventions. We're called upon to create services. We're called to, uh, to, to create components thereof. And so some of us, uh, most of us, maybe all of us have been part of the process of solving a problem by introducing a solution to solve that problem. So I want you to help me. I need you to help me design. Uh, more than I'd like to admit, I need you to help me to design. Now I put up a picture of my son. This is a picture of my daughter, Ada. Ada is about eight months old now. You can see I am, she's the, my, my absolute darling. Look at those eyes. Um, the only problem with this photo is that it was taken at three o'clock in the morning because my daughter, <laughs> unlike my son, uh, just doesn't like to sleep ever. Maybe I mean maybe almost literally ever, uh, but but she's she's not a a talented sleeper. So my wife and I are exhausted, um, and my daughter is occasionally cranky. Uh, this is probably the happiest photo of her I have. Um, but uh, I need your help. I need your help to figure out what to do. And and to try something. Think for a moment by yourself. You don't have to say it out loud if you don't want to. How would you start helping me? What's the first thing you would do to help solve this problem? Think for a moment again by yourself. Take 60 seconds just to think about where you'd start. And if you have an answer, or if you want to share your answer, please chat it to me. Uh, not, not privately, you can chat it to me in the public channel. And apologies, I, I will inevitably uh, mispronounce names. Terhi, thank you for the offer to come babysit. I see some folks, I see some folks starting I'd get a better picture of what's going on in your family situation. I'd look at your family's schedule. Uh, apart from I would come babysit for you, I'd, I'd start by asking questions, right? I would figure out more about your situation. We even see some examples of some spe uh, specific questions. What have you done to improve her sleeping habits? So what have you tried already? Maybe what has been successful? Uh, that's a, a appreciative inquiry. Um, what does she like? What doesn't she like? What makes her calm? Thank you, <laughs> Rena, for the, for the recommendation. Um, ask more about my specific problem with her. And then we see some folks that are saying, here are some things that I would just try. Let's try music. Let's try some warm milk. So generally, yeah, um, that seems like a great place to start. I'd start by asking questions. I'd start by finding out more about the problematic situation. I would... Uh, we have sort of decided together that we don't know enough yet um, to take any drastic measures. We might take some small measures, try some things that have worked in the past, make some attempts, learn from those attempts, right? We'll, we'll take her for a walk, we'll bounce her a little bit. Does that work? No? Okay. All right. We're going to play for a little bit more. Um, we're going to sing a song. We'll see how that works. Um, but generally, what we're doing right now is sort of prodding, 
the situation. We're, we're poking it a little bit to see how it responds. Right? We're asking questions of it. We're interrogating it. We're exploring it. We're seeking understanding. You might say that we're sensing. We're taking information in at present, right? Okay, so we've done our research. Um, We've got lots and lots of, we know she, uh, our schedule looks like this, and we know that uh, we've got some, um, you know, she, she doesn't love uh, warm milk. Well, she's a baby, of course she loves warm milk. We know that she doesn't love to sing, uh, but she loves to bounce. Um, we know that singing her music, actually uh, singing her song gets her a little bit more excited. Um, we've also done some, probably learned a little bit, and I, I didn't see this, I think, I'd learn a little bit more about the environment around her, the, the sort of context. Uh, I, would, I would maybe record what's going on uh, during the evening. Oh, are there loud noises every morning at three o'clock because there's an airport nearby and a giant uh, plane takes off? Um, I would learn more about the people involved in the situation. Who does she spend her, who puts her to bed? Who does she spend her evenings with? Um, or the neighbor, what's going on with the neighbor? Do the neighbors hear her screaming when she wakes up at three o'clock in the morning? So I'm making lots of observations, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing lots of interrogation. I'm doing a lot of learning and that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm getting more and more inputs. What do I do next? What would you do next? We have all of this data, all of these uh, findings. What are we gonna do with everything that we've learned about this problematic situation? What's the next thing? How would you help me? Take 60 seconds, think to yourself, now that you have all of this data, so much more that we can even handle, right? We have all these research inputs. What's the next step? Take 60 seconds, think about that, and then chat your answer to me if you, if you feel uh, you have something that you wanna share. privately, that's fine too. About another 15, 20 seconds. Ah, because I see somebody has done this before. I have all of these research inputs. I probably have even more than I can make sense of, right? Or, or I should say I have more than I, than I know what to do with. I've interviewed 15 people and they all say I should try 15 different things. I've done all of this. I've recorded the audio of the entire evening and uh, I hear some bumping around in the kitchen. I hear a plane take off, so on and so forth, right? All of these things. I need to make a decision now around what from this, all of this information, this universe of data, what actually matters? I'm not yet ready to try something because I don't know yet exactly what the problem is. I have lots of ideas about what the problem might be. I even have some potential solutions already. I have lots of, let's see, we call it the precursors, the inputs to the idea of what the problem might be. Maybe it's the noise, maybe it's something in her schedule, maybe uh, she gets startled, maybe, I don't the room's too warm. I have all of these findings and together, I'm gonna put them together. I'm gonna start to categorize them. I'm going to start to make sense of all of this research, all of these inputs, okay? So first I sensed, I took in all this data and now I'm gonna make sense. I'm gonna pick out what's salient. And then I'm gonna kind of come around the corner. I'm gonna say, okay, it's definitely the noise. Three o'clock every morning, there is a giant, and this is true. Uh, there, is a, there is a very small airport nearby. 
from which a enormous uh, uh, galaxy, like giant military aircraft takes off at three o'clock every morning, All right? So I, I have made some decisions around what's happening and what is the problem? Or I should say, what is the cause of the problem? What's driving the problem? On what thing in this problematic situation do we need to intervene? So now we agree, three o'clock every morning, there's a plane taking off, waking my daughter up. Now we know, what are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do now? We agree on the problem. We say, or we agree on the cause of the problem. My daughter's waking up because a giant plane making a lot of noise wakes her up at three o'clock in the morning every morning. What do we do next? Take 60 seconds and think about what we're gonna do next. move, <laughs> if only. Do nothing. Oh, the non, that's the, the non-interventionist approach, nice. I see people saying effectively, apart from move, <laughs> which unfortunately not an option. I see either a, a recognition that um, we're going to want to, to come up with some ways of addressing this issue, some potential solutions. We're going to uh, ideate, we're gonna generate new solutions, possible solutions. Or I see some actual suggestions, get some soundproof windows, move, right? There are lots of things that we could do. But at this stage, once we've landed on the definition of the problem, we said, this is what's happening. This is what is driving this issue. We're going to uncover some potential solutions, lots of potential solutions. We're going to brainstorm. We're going to think broadly about what we can do to solve this situation and get my, my little girl back to sleep. And I also see this last piece. We're going to try some of those things, right? We're going to see which ones work. Um, we're going to uh, try some soundproofing. We're going to try a white noise machine and we're going to learn from that experience. So we're actually going to uh, build our solution and we're going to test it, right? And I don't want to belabor the point, but you, you see where we're driving here. Just in this simple problem solving exercise, we have uncovered uh, the origins or uh, if not the origins, a bit of a definition of design thinking. It's a way of investigating and understanding people's needs and meeting those needs by delivering solutions. Full stop. There are lots of ways to slice it, right? Uh, we, could, we could do many different things within that broad frame, but ultimately when we talk about design thinking, we're talking about researching in order to understand, to make sense of people's needs. And we're talking about putting in place solutions uh, to those needs. End of story. Kind of, there's a little bit more than that. We find that design thinking, and, and I, will, I need to make it so clear here, part of the, uh, the magic of design thinking in our space is that we already do many, many things in the same order that feel the same way as design thinking. So if you're hearing this definition, this emerging definition, don't worry, there's more to come. And you're thinking, I already do that. This is how we do everything. You're right. You do already do that. This is how you do so many things. Design thinking is about not in our space. Design thinking is about not dramatically changing the way we do what we do, but it's about accessing opportunities to augment the way we do what we do. It's about expanding our toolkit, bringing in new mental tools, uh, thinking tools, bringing in new stances, new approaches, new ways of uh, approaching or addressing a problem. But it's not a radical departure from the way development and humanitarian practice already takes place. And in some ways, I think that's what makes our sector so ripe to 
operate in this way because it's just a stretch. It's about doing something that is a little bit further, a little bit more than, uh, a little bit um, uh, perhaps elaborated upon the work that we presently do. And design thinking, like our work, follows a pattern. And that pattern is this. We start by sensing. We're taking in information from the environment. You'll see this sliced so many different ways in different design thinking handbooks and resources and, and practitioners. But ultimately, we start by gathering information about the problematic, about the problematic situation that we're seeking to address uh, with and for uh, rights holders, stakeholders, uh, with and for people. So we sensed. Sensing, taking in information at this stage, acknowledging that we can't know what's going to be salient, what's going to be relevant, what's going to be the, the piece of information that drives the insight that gets us to a solution. We don't know yet. So we take in lots and lots of information. We take in, we make tremendous number of observations. We ask all of the questions, all of the questions we can think to ask because we don't know at this stage what's going to make the difference in sensing, but in making sense, acknowledging that we have so much more information that we could possibly take advantage of, we need to find a way to sort that, to categorize it, to filter it, to begin to discover themes, to begin to discover insights, and those insights about the lived experience and the systems, uh, the lived experience, pardon, of the people who are involved in the problem and the systems uh, that either constitute, support, or uh, persist, maintain that problem. Um, we need to begin to find uh, 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 sort of the key points, the salient points, the relevant data. And that happens in this making sense phase where we begin to filter. We begin to synthesize. We begin to take those pieces and turn them into a design question. And that design question often takes the form as a how might we, it doesn't need to. That guides our next stage where we actually ideate, where we start to generate now solutions, all right? We've come to a decision about what is the problem, the nature of the problem, the driver of our original problem, the piece of our system that we want to act on. And in the ideation phase, we begin to ask ourselves, okay, what are we gonna do about it? Ideation often takes the form of brainstorming, right? That's a common approach to ideation. There are many, many different approaches apart from just the traditional brainstorming of us kind of sitting around on a table, maybe with sticky notes, writing down everything that comes to mind uh, to get us to a series of potential solutions. Oftentimes during this phase, we start to take potential solutions and arrange them into design concepts. Um, acknowledging that it's probably not, if we use my, my sleeping example, it's probably not just the soundproofing, it's probably not just the white noise machine, but it may in fact be a combination of things in sequence that leads to the problem being solved. Um, so we've developed and, and elaborated a design concept at this phase. And the last bit here, we're gonna put it into practice. And very importantly, in the design thinking approach and in our approach, in the humanitarian and development communities approach, we're not just gonna put it in practice in a five-year plan and then stand back and we'll do a midterm evaluation and we'll do a final evaluation and then we're done, right? We put our solution in practice and we learn from it constantly. And we make changes as we go along to improve it. In fact, you'll see this particular pattern, this pattern of building a thing, measuring the success, the efficacy, the efficiency of that thing. Does it work? Doesn't it work? Does it cost too much? Who does it work for? Who doesn't it work for? And then taking those measurements and learning from them. And this process does not stand on its own, but this is something that happens again and again over the course of implementing or executing on our solution, of delivering our solution. We call this the build, measure, learn loop, right? This is probably one of the most common patterns that we see emerge in design and design thinking. Um, further, uh, apart from being a, a common pattern, um, it is transferable. This is a pattern that we see in 
related approaches that are related to design thinking like lean startup like um oh pardon i can't see my notes so i can't remember the other one. Oh, even appreciative i mean there are many many places in which we see the build measure learn loop take place but design thinking like our work acknowledges that you can't put in place a solution and imagine it's going to be perfect from the start you need to build a piece of a solution learn from it and then iterate upon them and this build measure learn loop this process of iteration is something that we see happen again and again over the course of our uh delivery and to be frank uh although not to belabor the point we see these loops take place even within the frame at every stage of of design thinking even as we're asking our questions at the sensing stage our questions are getting better and sharper the more uh, interviews we do. Even during making sense when we're starting to make selections about uh, which insights uh, are salient or relevant, our insights are going to get cleaner. They're going to get more relevant uh, as we move through the process. Our ideas are going to get better, our concepts more elaborate during ideation. We see this process of trying something seeing how it works, seeing how it fits the situation, and learning from doing, learning from trying it, uh, happened throughout uh, the, 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 the design thinking uh, experience. Einstein once said, how'd you like that? It's tricky. I tried that last night. I was like, I hope this animation works because it's kind of cool, uh, but I never use animations in my slides. I feel like this was particularly, it, it just felt right. So. Check this out. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at that. If we imagine for a moment that this is not just a uh, this line here, this dotted line through the middle, is not just a um, uh, uh, sort of asking not how do I put my daughter back to sleep, but how do I help my daughter sleep through a plane flying low overhead, right? Because more milk and a song isn't going to help her when there's a, a Galaxy C-17 flying, you know, 10,000 feet over our heads. Asking the right question is integral to delivering the right thing. And so we spend a lot of time sensing our environment, sensing the problem and making sense of the problem before we ever start to imagine solutions, certainly, right? That's a fraught exercise, the imagining part. And even uh, far more time, arguably, um, than, than we spend building and testing. Now, building and testing, acknowledging that there's iteration can go on indefinitely. But uh, at least for that first bit, that kind of what we consider the build, the initial build and test phase, as compared to sensing and making sense, we spend tremendously more time uh, on those on those pieces of work. So, so again, you know what? I love it so much. I'm going to do it one more time. We're not spending four equal <laughs> periods, right? This isn't uh, the design thinking uh, process. Doesn't look like uh, spend one week sensing, one week making sense, one week ideating, one week building and testing. It's it's more much more like spend as much time as possible figuring out the right question to ask, and then imagining, and then sometime imagining solutions, and a lot of time again, uh, building and iteratively uh, building upon potential solutions. Everyone who's seen a design thinking presentation is like, okay, I was wondering when we were gonna start talking about diamonds. I, I show this as a flat line, but this process doesn't look like a flat line. Right. We talked in the beginning when we were discussing, um, you know, getting lots and lots of data and then making decisions about the relevant data, coming up with lots and lots of ideas and then slowly kind of honing in on which idea we're going to carry forward, building many, many potential prototypes. We'll talk about prototyping later and then figuring out which prototype or elements of the prototype we're going to carry forward into the next stage. We see 
again and again in our work, and I mean that as designers, as humanitarian and development practitioners, we see again and again in our work this process of divergence. I don't know if you can see me making silly hand gestures. I look like I'm doing the baby shark dance when I do this. Uh, uh, we see this process of divergence and convergence again and again and again, of coming up with many, many uh, ideas and then evaluating those ideas to come to one or two or three. Coming up with many, 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 many research inputs and then determining what of those research, that universe of information is relevant to our problem. We see this uh, process, this diamond um, happen throughout uh, the, the design thinking process. And I'm a big fan of the design council uh, visualization of the design process. This is um, uh, canonically known as the double diamond of design. And it is an acknowledgement, it is an acknowledgement that design works through this process of divergence and convergence. I am taking in lots of data. I am making sense of that data to come to a question, to ask, be able to ask myself a question. I am coming up with many possible solutions and then I am evaluating those solutions and building and testing as I narrow down, as I hone in on one. And again, this process of the double diamonds, much like iteration, is not something that just happens in the large scale, but it happens almost fractally, you know, fractals, right? It happens almost fractally throughout the design process. Even as I'm trying individual prototypes during build and test, I'm coming up with possible solutions, possible prototypes, possible elements of that prototype, and I'm determining what is relevant to my research objectives. Even as I'm making sense, as I'm building um, uh, some of the artifacts that I'll need to guide ideation, things like personas, things like you know tools that we've heard of before, I am probably building several versions of all of those, and then I'm evaluating their effectiveness, their fit to my needs, and I'm narrowing down on one version. So we see this diamond shape of emergence, of divergence and convergence happen again and again over the course of design pro uh, the design process. And so in short, design thinking, a way of investigating and understanding people's needs and meeting those needs by delivering solutions. And it's a way that follows a few patterns. And so our first, uh, Wait, where are we? Okay, so really, is that it? Because it feels like there's gotta be more. And there is, but we'll get to that after a little break. So I wanna take a moment here to um, ask first a, a, a sort of a poll question. We were gonna do some polls, the polls don't seem to be working. So we'll just chat our responses. Where do you see these patterns, both of the, the sort of phases of patterns of iteration, patterns of spending lots of time to define the problem and a little time to come up with solutions, and patterns of emergent or emergence, divergence and convergence. Where do you see these patterns appear in your work today? While you're taking a few moments, oh, oh sorry. While you're taking a few moments to think on that question and please chat your answer um, as, you, as, it, as it comes to you. Uh, I want to take a few moments and see if there are questions about what we covered uh, in, in, thus far. And um, Mika, forgive me, I don't, I don't know how you want to handle questions. Um, uh, if you want to have, I don't know if we have like the hand raising function. I mean, I, I leave it up to you. Um, but what we can do is that uh, if you come up with any questions, just please uh, write them um, in the chat and we will be gathering them. them. And maybe um, at least at the very end of the session, we can uh, have a short Q&A maybe where we can then, you know, ask those um, questions and provide future um, time to answer those um, questions at that point as well. That's one option uh, to have to go forward with that. But yeah, if you have uh, any immediate questions or comments to Josh, so now it's a good time, just uh, open your mic and uh, and go ahead. Or then as Mika said, 
write it in the chat window and uh, we'll pick it up also later on. Since my mic is open and this is uh, so interesting, so I'll, I'll just say that first, I, I really like the, uh, the, the point that these three, fa four phases are not equal and they should be like, uh, like Einstein said, understanding the, the problem or the challenge takes most time. But I think in many cases, it, it's the opposite. Like we completely skip the understanding the problem, take a lot of post-it notes and start ideating solutions to a, some kind of a problem we didn't pay that much attention. And I, 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 maybe everybody has been there, like completely skipping the most important part. So that was very, very well. Your animation did the job. Good, good. I'm glad. Oh, I, I, um, I mean, we're we're all development professionals. We've experienced this. I, I know that in in some of your heads, in my head, I'm always thinking, yeah, that sounds great. But the donor wants the proposal tomorrow. <laughs> that sounds great, but you know our our management is expecting uh, us to to start implementing. We've got cycles to take care. Of. We've got funding cycles. There are many ways in which reality confronts um, uh, this this sort of ideal process. I think um, now we we unfortunately don't have time to cover it here. Um, I've been working with some collaborators who have also been experiencing this to talk a little bit and figure out a little bit of how this uh, design process actually can map. One can map to our existing uh, design, uh, uh, technical design, program design uh, approaches. Um, how it does, as Irena uh, noted, it does in some ways, uh, and where I've had success employing it in my own work with UNICEF, uh, with CARE, UNDP, others, um, has has been uh, pro just project cycle. It feels like project cycle management. There are ways in which we can sort of slide this into our effort and donors don't even necessarily know about it um, if they, they uh, you know, if they're, they're not inclined. Um, but all that is to say that because it sort of maps to our work and can map to our work, we can find ways of doing this. Um, and I've had some success even with like tricky bilaterals, USG, uh, Austrians, um, I mean, EU, uh, EU can be challenging. I don't know what your experience has been. Um, we found ways of kind of fitting this in. So, um, okay, that seems to be, why design thinking now? Uh, I'm gonna hold on to that. I think that's an awesome question. Well, and, and there are other design processes. Um, I don't think that design thinking is, design thinking in, in my estimation or the way I teach it is really an umbrella uh, under which a number of design uh, sort of methods or, or more sort of granular design approaches uh, fit. Um, I think people kind of locate them relative to one another in different ways. Um, but uh, yeah, that is to say that uh, there are certainly alternatives. I don't necessarily even advocate that design thinking the four steps is uh, the right way to approach every problem. But I do sort of think of it as a meta approach, even other methodologies kind of follow this pattern. So I wanna keep us moving. Thank you all for taking the time to, to reflect. Uh, great questions. Um, and I, I wanna come back. Uh, first off, this is really invaluable information for me just to hear your thoughts. Uh, and also I wanna come back and do a little synthesis on this when I send out a resource document to you at the end of this or I should say after this presentation. So let's keep pressing. So that's it, so that's it, that's the whole thing. That's what everybody's been talking about design thinking, right? That's, that's a, it's a way of meeting people's needs, great. Well, yeah, there's always a catch, right? There's a little bit more to it. What's a need? What are we talking about when we say a need? Um, I need another, cup of tea <laughs> like is that what design thinking is what do we need to design think that no there are a few dimensions or a few ways of categorizing or thinking about people's needs 
and a few ways of, of of thinking about people's needs that I would say are um, are a a uh, that fit the pattern of of reflection, interrogate, and interrogation that is kind of integral to a designerly approach. One is thinking about present needs, needs that exist right now, um, needs that we are experiencing right now. I need more tea. I need that right now. I'm going to keep using this as an example, by the way. So I need that now. But one, uh, but but sort of counter to this idea of present needs is emerging or future needs. Design uh, thinking encourages us via the methods, uh, via the mindsets, to be thinking not just of needs as they are expressed or as they are felt in the moment, but needs as they emerge out of the systems uh, that govern the problems that we're experiencing. And so we use when we use design, we're looking not just at the needs that I feel right now, but we're looking at the ways in which those needs drive or contribute to, or the ways in which other elements of the problematic drive or contribute to uh, future or emerging needs. Cool. There's another axis. We have what we call individual or isolated needs. My need of tea, I mean, yes, it exists in a system insofar as you know, my body is telling me that I'm thirsty because my cells have an imbalance of salt in the water, whatever, whatever, whatever. I haven't had biology in a long time. But nevertheless, uh, anyone who's working in, in food security is probably appalled that I just messed up, uh, or water security, uh, that I just messed up that explanation so badly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, my, my need uh, uh, is, is pretty immediate. It's pretty isolated to me. Uh, my needing tea doesn't impact you tremendously unless I start uh, having a coughing fit and can't recover from it. Um, it's something that exists in isolation. It's an individual personal need. But the counter to that would be something like, I don't know, climate change. Uh, something that emerges from systems, something that emerges or exists in uh, the relationships between elements of a system, between individuals in a system, uh, something that is, in a way, future needs are about needs that emerge over time. Systemic needs are about needs that emerge from the interrelationship of the actors or actants is a nice word for it in, uh, in a system or in an ecosystem. I love to give the example when we talk about isolated and systemic needs or isolated and systemic problems of the way the world talks about climate change. Uh, many of you, because you are either are from or are working in far more enlightened countries on this issue than, than me in the United States are familiar with this concept already, but there is a great deal of um, problematization right now of the narrative of climate change, whereby we're telling individuals you need to recycle more and you as an individual need to take one less flight per year. And you as an individual need to um, drive a few more miles or drive a few less miles or ride your bike a little bit more. When in fact, the vast majority of air pollution comes from 100 corporations around the world, full stop, right? So we take what is a systemic problem, what is a from a, the interaction of actors, the interaction, the, the relationships between actors, and is something that exists at a very large scale. And we try to define it as an individual or an isolated problem. It's about you riding your bike. It's about what you throw away, the single use plastics that you use. Now, don't get me wrong, please. Uh, we should all be doing absolutely everything we can to fight climate change, to invite environmental degradation. And yet, this problem is not a problem that emerges because you use a plastic straw. It's a problem that emerges because we all do. And we all do because that's what's made available to us. And that's what's made available to us because that's what is profitable to a certain segment of, of corporations that are providing this to us. And this is not an anti-corporate rant, but it is, again, just to say that this is a problem that emerges from relationships. And there is another um, there is another uh, axis, right? And do you like how I made the, the dots a little bigger on one side? So this is my Z axis, this is my depth axis, right? 
Um, and this other axis deals with needs. Sorry, I can hear my daughter having woken up. Um, uh, so this other axis deals with needs that are, and I think someone mentioned this already, needs that are explicit, needs that we know to name right now. I'm thirsty. I want tea. My absence of tea is a problem. Do I know to name a need to uh, change the um, conditions under which the hundred largest corporations of the world is operating or operating so that uh, we can uh, halt uh, climate change or reverse climate change, eventually halt environmental degradation. I might not know to name it in that way, to name, to say that that's the problem. Even if I'm experiencing elements of that problem myself, when we're dealing with California wildfires, air pollution in Pristina, air pollution in Beijing, so on and so forth. The counter to explicit needs, needs that I or anyone knows to say, to put a name to right now, are implicit needs. Needs that are either uh, contributors in that ecosystem um, problem, sort of the antecedent to the problem that we can put a name to, a name on, or problems that are emerging. Um, uh, explicit, again, when we are thinking in terms of, or I should say, when we are thinking like designers, very often, as we're doing our explanation, we're thinking in terms of, uh, our tendency is to think in terms of what people say they need right now, or what we can see right now. But explicit needs very often are present needs, and they are needs that exist in isolation. If you'll notice that the, the sort of trend on this graph, it is an opportunity to use design thinking in collaboration with other methods, particularly systems thinking. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time today to talk about the relationship between the two. To drive our work from a focus on the present, the explicit and the isolated or individual to problems that are systemic, that are implicit, that are oriented toward the future, to problems that are emergent. And in that distinction, right, we sort of see the origin of the term wicked problem or complex problems, problems that are multivariable, problems that are sticky, that don't have any one easy solution. But design thinking, as we go deeper, as we spend more and more time on understanding the challenge, lets us orient our solutions toward those systemic implicit and future problems. Oh, one second. And so when we're talking about needs, we're talking about meeting people's present explicit and isolated needs and future implicit and systemic needs. Okay, so that's it. Just kidding, that's not it either. There's another word in here that's really sticks out to me. It's kind of thorny, um, solutions. I think solutions and solutionism, the idea that we can only define a problem by the available solutions, uh, really, really sort of problematic, um, uh, both in design as a practice and in uh, development work. Even the idea that every problem is a problem that can be solved or that has something that we'd call a solution, also a problematic idea. Um, but let's talk, you know, acknowledging the, the ways in which this is a thorny word. Let's talk about what we mean when we talk about solutions uh, in the designerly sense. I think we can acknowledge, <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a higher resolution version of this. This comes from Dr. Stephanie DeRusso, not like a, an enormous design academic, but has done some really, really great work on the history of design thinking and how design thinking gets used. Uh, she is um, coming out of Swinburne University. Uh, this, this, this visual looks at the kinds of solutions, the areas of solutions that design thinking has been employed to address. Um, everything from how do I build you a new pair of sneakers straight up to how do I design entire new public policies? How do I design new social infrastructure? How do I design new public services, All right? So there are many, many types um, in terms of the, the sort of format uh, of a solution that solutions uh, th that emerge from design thinking can take. But there's another way to think of them. Um, this is a tool, or this is the home screen of a tool that um, 
my team uh, built at UNICEF in 2015, 2016, in response to what was called the refugee and migrant crisis in Europe. Um, this was a tool that enabled folks uh, who were working in UNICEF's child-friendly spaces and mother-baby uh, corners along the Balkan route into Europe, who were providing services to refugees and migrants as they were moving through the Balkan route into Europe, um, to gather information in a rights-respecting, privacy-respecting way about refugees and migrants um, in order for UNICEF to improve its planning, its, its sort of planning at the operational level and to improve its reporting and, and all the good things that come with reporting, resource mobilization, et cetera, et cetera. When we were asked to explore the, the challenges that uh, refugees and migrants were facing in these, in these areas, uh, in these child-friendly spaces, in the mother-baby corner, um, when we were asked also to explore the challenges that service providers were experiencing and, and, and imagine uh, some solutions that we could implement uh, to improve that experience, we started, or I should say the conversation naturally went one place. It went to the question of feasibility. And this was sort of the, the we, we so, uh, just to step back a little bit, what we discovered was that people on the route into Europe felt substantial urgency to complete their journey uh, for any number of reasons, the absolute uh, inestimable hardship of, of leaving your home and walking across a continent, uh, the simple fact that they had no security as they were uh, moving through the process, the, the, the concern that European countries were and, and continue to close their borders, uh, so on and so forth. There was lots and lots of urgency. So there was a question about how can we make this experience uh, something where we get people what they need, but we don't slow them down. At the same time, there was absolute urgent. The, the countries that were responding, uh, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, were not uh, either the governments or, or uh, the, the competent actors not uh, capacitated to do this type of work. I mean, Macedonia has not had a ton of experience, Balkan wars notwithstanding, in conducting uh, refugee and migrant response work. Um, uh, UNICEF in Serbia was set up almost explicitly to do policy advocacy work. There was no service, uh, service delivery taking place. And so we needed to enable folks to do things easily that folks who are doing humanitarian performance monitoring and, and humanitarian response elsewhere in the world uh, know how to do. And so it sort of comes naturally. Uh, it did not for them. And so we needed to enable this process um, to be faster, to be easier, <clears throat> to be more learningful also uh, for, for folks uh, who were providing the services at, at these spaces. But when we started to talk about solutions, everyone sort of naturally wanted to go to this question of feasibility. What can we do? And when I say, what can we do? I mean, what are we technically able to provide? Feasibility is a question of our technical capabilities. What solutions can we technologically uh, from a resource perspective, so on and so forth, actually put into place? And that is one element of thinking about solutions. A solution must be technically feasible. If I imagine, you know, a solution, every solution requires a, a fleet of helicopters and a half a billion dollars, unless I'm Jeff Bezos, I'm probably not going to be able to put that solution in place. And so there is a question always of the technical, of the resource, of the operational feasibility of any particular solution that I want to deliver. But design doesn't stop with just the question of, can we technically do it? Design thinking, uh, it's emergent and it's emergence from you know design as a practice uh, always asks does anyone want it there were versions of the refugee and migrant data collection tool what ends up being called hpm wire humanitarian performance monitoring by the way it end, just as an aside this ended up being it's a tablet based and mobile based application where folks who are doing service provision can very quickly and easily in a way that maps to their workflow 
both use this tool to deliver services and then also at the same time collect the types of data that uh, both UNICEF at the uh, UNICEF and partners at the site level, at the country level, at the region and globally uh, needed in order to uh, conduct their operational planning and, and also uh, do their reporting. So a bit on what it actually was. There were versions of that tool that nobody wanted. They were hard to use. They asked prying questions. They didn't deliver the, uh, the information or um, uh, didn't deliver the information to folks in a way that was usable to them. That little screen that you saw is just the front end. There's a whole architecture of stuff going on beside, behind it that would actually you know, aggregate and slice that information and deliver uh, reports all the way up to the executive director of UNICEF daily, so on and so forth. But those products, the, the elements of the solution weren't actually desired. Nobody wanted what we were offering. And not just in the sense that like, I don't like the colors or it doesn't do exactly what I needed to do, but there were some fundamental things uh, about our solution, uh, our initial solution, the way it required people to be counted in line, which felt very uh, denigrating the way in which it would require uh, folks to sort of slow down their process and ask a bunch of questions before delivering a bunch of services that made it not a desirable solution. And it doesn't matter if we could technically deliver it. All of those things technically worked, right? Those early versions of the application technically worked. They were feasible, but they weren't desirable. No one wanted them. And so I don't get uptake. No one uses the thing. And there's a third element as well, because great, I could build the solution technically, I could design it in such a way that it meets the, 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 the legion needs of the many, many people, many stakeholders, uh, all, all the way from rights holders, straight on up to you know, UNICEF management, uh, government partners, so on and so forth, that it would be desirable to them. But I still have to ask also this question of viability. I can do this thing right now, but have I built a model that will persist over time? Technically, I could deliver a desirable solution. Cool. Could I train people? Could I maintain it? Could I pay for it? Could I fix it when it was broken? All of these questions of viability um, are asking about the ability of the model, not just the, the point solution, but the whole model to uh, exist and persist over time in the environment in which the solution is located. And so feasibility is, I'm sort of interrogating the product itself or service itself and our capabilities to deliver in the moment. Desirability, I'm trying to understand the needs and wants of stakeholders and what will and will not resonate with them. Viability, I'm asking whether or not my model, the whole of the intervention can work over time in context. Design thinking is, oops, design thinking is occupied, preoccupied with these three questions. And so when I'm delivering solutions, design thinking asks me to consider feasible, desirable, and viable solutions. Cool. I want to talk, pause here for a moment. Oh. Um, so this would be a place where we'd have a poll, but I'm going to ask you to chat your answer. And I'd really love to hear, you know, you can write it to me individually if you don't want to share, whatever the case may be. I would love, love to hear uh, everyone's response to this poll question. The inter and at the same time, as you're thinking about your response to the poll question, I want to take needs on uh, take needs. Pardon, I want to take questions about uh, about needs, about this concept of needs and the types of needs, about um, also uh, solutions and the types or pardon uh, needs and the types of needs and solutions and the types of solutions. Please chat your questions or raise your questions and also have a think about our poll question and respond in the chat. The interventions I work on most struggle, or pardon, the interventions I work on most struggle with feasibility, 
desirability or viability or nothing. Everything's great all the time. That's that's possible too, right? Maybe we're, we're our team is just a crack team. It's perfect. But where do you most struggle? Uh, solutions that are viable, solutions that are desirable. People actually want them. They want to use them. They want to use and engage in the components thereof or solutions that are technically feasible. We keep trying to do things uh, that aren't within our capabilities to deliver. I'll take a moment while you're responding. And again, please, if you do have any questions on our last section, uh, let me know. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And we'll take, a, we'll take about two minutes here to do this. Take a break. Ooh, Ula, that's a good comment. Two minutes. I see a lot of C's, but I think Ula, would you feel comfortable sharing your your comment with the group? Because I think it's it's just tremendously insightful. Yeah, I was thinking that you know we very very uh, seldom look at all the three issues. We focus on uh, viability or sustainability. Um, but but we don't uh, really think what what are the you know the the, the steps to bring in uh, a viable solution. It might be I mean the way you explained it it really rang a bell to me and okay this is a sort of combination combination of things that we need to consider not jump into you know for instance viability immediately so. I, I, it's just a sort of insight I had. Yeah. Can't really, most probably, not explain it in 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 any feasible way. No, I, th I, th I think it's I think it's perfect, um, and I'm I'm so glad that you lifted this up. I, something that I didn't give voice to um, is that there is, you know, this is not just a. a I don't know what the synonym for rhetorical would mean when I'm talking about a picture, but it's it's not for pretty. There is an there is an intimate relationship between these things. My models don't work over time unless the thing that I'm delivering is desirable, or unless there are technical capabilities to deliver it over time. We could build that HPM wire solution, send a bunch of tablets out in the field. I mean, how often have you heard this story, right? send a bunch of tablets out in the field and then no one can maintain it or repair it. So there is, when we're thinking about viability, what we're often finding is that there are, there, there are bottlenecks emerge 
from desirability, from feasibility. How many times has this been the case? Your you've seen an intervention that becomes less desirable over time because it wasn't viable, because they did, we didn't have like the long-term, um, let's use something so basic of, of, this used to happen in Pristina all the time, the, the local government, and forgive me Kosovo for, for knocking you, I, I love you dearly. Uh, uh, the local government would introduce some great new, extremely desirable uh, intervention. Um, these new fancy uh, below ground garbage collection bins that are like super expensive and you don't see the rubbish, there are no dumpsters, there's nothing. Extremely desirable, but it's a, definitely a vote getter, except there was no plan for how, like, no one bought one, no one bought the trucks that they needed to actually empty this special kind of garbage thing. So technically infeasible, and there was no plan or money to buy the trucks or train anyone to do it or sustain this thing over time. And so what started out as a desirable solution because it was not technically feasible, because it was not viable in the long term, slowly became a pariah of a solution. I mean, it became an embarrassment and almost took down a government. So there is, a, there is an intimate relationship between these things and what often may manifest as an issue of viability, in part because we as development practitioners are encouraged to think in that way. What is our sustainability plan? You know, section nine on everyone's, <laughs> on everyone's uh, project proposal. Tell us about your sustainability plan actually so often stems not from just the ability to raise money in perpetuity or you know capacitate the government to for transfer or whatever whatever but it comes from the design of the solution and it comes from uh, desirability and feasibility uh, uh ula i want to thank you again for for lifting that up i i think it's it's such an important uh reflection to note that the the, the relationship between these things and our tendency to think in terms uh, first of viability. So um, thanks everyone for uh, for the poll responses. I, I can't wait to take a look at that and do some some quantification. Uh, see where we ended up. Okay, so that's it. No, of course, of course not. I mean, of course that's not it. A little bit more. Design thinking wouldn't be design thinking. Right? It would just be doing what we always do. If we weren't actually using the mindset, skills, and methods of design. And by this, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with the, the intellectual heritage of design, but design roughly emerges from the practice of design all the way back to kind of the industrial practice. It emerges also from engineering. Um, it emerges uh, from design in the traditional sense, graphic design. Um, uh, a big piece of what, some of the best thinkers, by the way, on design historically have come out of uh, Finland. So you're in you're in good company there. Um, but that that lineage has given us tools, ways of thinking, stances to solve problems that we roughly call design. So it's thinking like a designer to investigate and understand people's needs and meet them with solutions. It's doing design to do that. And what do I mean by that? I mean a few things. One, I mean the mindsets. I'm not going to belabor these. I'm gonna move through these fairly quickly. Um, but that said, um, there are a few that I want to, to call out. This list of mindsets for design is a synthesis of you know, you're going to see several practitioners, thinkers, schools of thought. There's the Helsinki School of Thought. There's Stanford. Uh, there's there's Hassel Plattner uh, in Germany. Many many different groups saying these are the mindsets or the stances or the principles of design. This list here, you're not going to see in any one place, right? This is what I teach my students, um, and that is a synthesis of all of these these uh, these mindsets. Um, there are just a few that I want to talk about. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's for later. All right. The first is to center humans, but think in systems. We've talked about this already, 
we talked about, when we talked about the ways in which needs can be individual, uh, they can be present or uh, individual or, or systemic, present or future or emergent. Um, design encourages us to 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 think first and to about and to lift up the lived experience of people uh, who are impacted by or otherwise connected to a system. In let's think of our systemic uh, problem uh, of of climate change. Climate change is a problem that emerges from the relationships between people and even from the relationships between people when people form corporations and governments and, and uh, pressure groups and lobby groups and, and citizen groups and so on and so forth. This is a problem that exists in, in the way that we relate to one another. Um, that problem, even though it's systemic and exists in relationships, still is grounded in, in people. People, the, there are CEOs of those hundred companies that are responsible for the majority of air pollution of, of carbon production around the world. There are stakeholder boards. There are people that do the work, just kind of grind it out day to day, right? Like there's uh, uh, each of those sort of individual microcosms are constituted by people and if we're going to affect that problem, if we're going to change anything about that problematic situation, our solution is going to target people, not a company. I can't change a company's mind. A company doesn't have a mind, but the minds of the people that work in the company, of the stakeholders, the board, the shareholders, whatever, whatever, I can actually address uh, their motivations, their drivers, right? I can target them, forgive the expression, with, with the solution. Um, so even when I'm elevating, as design tells me to, the lived experience, the motivations, the pain points of humans, of people, I'm also acknowledging in a way that sometimes design is bad at this. I'm acknowledging that people exist in, work in, are conditioned by, contribute to systems. Number two, adopt beginner's mind. What's beginner's mind? I want to play a little game. What's going on in this picture? Now, if you know the answer and you actually know like the context and all of this, please don't please don't chat. If I am uh, entering observation, sensing with a set of biases in mind. Well, you know what? Sorry, I don't want to go there yet. I actually want to uh, take 60 seconds and maybe chat some observations about what is happening in this photo. Nico, that's a, do you know that's a real thing? I don't know if you know this. There's this weird thing that they do in the southern United States where they, it's called noodling, uh, where they like go into rivers and they find like holes in the riverbed. And in order to catch catfish, they just stick their hands down these, these whole, like muddy, murky holes and yank the catfish out. They actually let the catfish like eat their hand to pull it out. It is terrifying. I can't imagine why anybody would do this. What a crazy thing, but I can't. That's the South for you. All right. Definitely. So I see a few, uh, yeah, I see some things here. A boy is petting his pet fish. Um, we're fishing, a boy catching a fish. There's some interesting things happening when I ask you to make observations about this, that we're bringing a set of assumptions to this. Um, I don't want to call anyone out, uh, you know, who, who can possibly know what's going on here. Uh, but we could be, I, I noticed an assumption, this is his pet fish. 
that he's trying to catch the fish as opposed to just putting the fish in the tub, or maybe he's just pointing toward the fish or whatever, whatever. We don't know. We are bringing in a, that orange bathroom. How is that for mid-century modern design? Seriously. Um, so we are bringing with us a set of assumptions, a set of biases, uh, whenever we are entering this, this um, sort of sensing stage. Beginner's mind asks us not to set aside those biases. We have to ask whether or not that's even possible. Those preconception, those beliefs about a system and what's happening, what's, how, it, how it operates, the people within it, but to acknowledge them, acknowledge that we have those preconceptions and attempt to set them aside as we make uh, our observations. What's actually happening here, by the way, my wife is Czech. Thank you, anyone who actually knows what's going on here. Czechs um, have carp for Christmas. It's the tradition. Uh, and they bring their fish home live. They buy it on the streets in these big containers. They bring it home live like a few days before Christmas. And they let it live in the bathtub which is the craziest thing. And every kid in the Czech Republic names their fish. They're like three year, a day, you know, it's a pet for three days and then it's dinner. Uh, they name it uh, Venceslas, the, the King Venceslas. So this is Venceslas and, uh, and the boy who's, who's going to, in a few days, eat him for Christmas dinner. But when we see this photo, right, there is a way of describing this photo that is strictly observation, um, a boy, appears to be touching a fish in what appears to be a bathroom uh, or in a tub. Um, and that is pretty much all we can say definitively about this photo. Is the, is the, what is the nature of the relationship between the boy and the fish? We have no idea. Is it a pet? Is it food? <laughs> we, we don't know. Is the boy putting the fish in, taking the fish out? Is it a boy? It could just be a girl with short hair. We say boy, boy, boy. We have no idea. Maybe the boy doesn't identify as a, or maybe this person doesn't identify as a boy or girl. No clue. For all we know, this person's 90 years old. Who knows? Um, it's very, very difficult for us to say uh, without introducing what, what's going on in this photo without introducing bias. Beginner's mind is about acknowledging those biases. It's about acknowledging that we have preconceptions about a system, about a problem as we enter that sensing space and we seek to account for those. Accounting for those looks like asking, how do you identify? Oh, what's your gender? Asking, uh, what do you intend to do with the fish? Asking, is the fish alive? Is the fish dead? Where did you get the fish? Is this in fact a bathroom? Whose bathroom is it? Asking questions, um, by, by adopting beginner's mind, we encourage ourselves, we enable ourselves to ask questions, discover elements of the problem space that if we just carried forward our biases, we would be blind to. All right. It is somewhat related to this concept of embracing ambiguity and crafting clarity. We acknowledge when we do design that we're not going to know the answer to every question. At the same time, we acknowledge that when we feel we have an answer, we need to make that uh, explicit. We need to work to make sure that everyone's on the same page. If I wanted to, without looking at this photo, just enable you to know what's going on in this picture, I would have to work to name the, the dimensions of the picture to give you the information that you need. I can't assume that you and I are on the same page. I can't assume that we have a shared understanding of the problem space. So again, this element is about an understanding that there are limits. There will always be limits to our understanding, uh, to the extent to which we can share knowledge or share a, a, an understanding of a, of a problematic. But when we believe there is clarity, it is our responsibility to produce that clarity. We have to do the work of making sure everyone understands, of making sure everybody's on the same page. Design also um, encourages us to have a bias toward action. Um, and we'll see that when we talk about experimentation, we'll see that when we talk about testing. And we've seen that over the course of our process, it's about getting out into the world. It's about trying things. It's about an orientation toward solutions, not solutions once and done, but solutions as a way of continuing to explore the problem of building so that we can measure and learn. But all of that depends on us having a bias to action. 
iteration we talked about endlessly, just to say that it exists across the, the, the uh, experience of design. What do I say when I mean be confidently creative? How does that show? Who, do you feel you're creative? You don't have to chat. Just think, like, do you feel creative? Do you feel like you're a creative person? You know, we don't need to, you don't need to respond. Just reflect on, on you know, how you relate to yourself in that question. I think design so often is, is um, considered the purview of like creative types. I don't even know what that word means anymore after doing this for 12, 12 years or so. I've never met anyone who's more or less creative than anyone else. Um, the folks that say like, I'm a technologist, I wanna be in the spreadsheets, I wanna be in the data. The creativity that I see with like data folks, folks that don't define themselves as creative is extraordinary. So when we say confident, be confidently creative, what we're actually saying is not like, can you draw? Everybody can draw a little bit. It's not saying like, are you an artist? Are you, you know, do you have a good sense of color? It's actually saying that our minds, human beings, right? All of our minds are extremely powerful pattern recognition and generative engines. And we can rely on our brains to be doing a lot of sort of subconscious thinking for us to find, to uncover patterns uh, and to come up with the, um, to, to make connections, to make leaps. And that is not, I don't mean when I say that like we're, we're incredible pattern finding engines, I don't mean that in like a spiritual sense or in a woo-woo sense. I mean like our neurobiology is incredibly good at finding patterns and using those patterns to create new things. That is, that is what we are powerful at. Rely on your brain to do that. Trust yourself, trust your brain to work in that way for you. And the last bit here, collaborate radically. Design really demands and the best design demands that we bring folks to the table or we come to the table. Um, far beyond where we would sort of naturally make delineations of who is within and who is without of the problem space or even the solution space. The best work that I have done, this is just anecdotal, but you know, we see this idea of a tendency toward collaboration everywhere. The best work that I have done on adolescent empowerment has been at a table with people who were certainly SMEs for adolescents, uh, youth and participation, but designers, <clears throat> graphic designers, technologists, marketing folks, entrepreneurs, um, a religious leader, uh, the more perspectives you have at the table and the more radically different, uh, the more even polar those perspectives at the table, the more complete picture you can get of the problematic, of the, the problematic situation uh, and the, the, the greater breadth um, of, of uh, the greater the potentiality, the greater breadth of possible uh, insights of possible solutions, the more divergent we can be. The more divergent we are, the better, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna pan for gold, you wanna make sure to put a lot of dirt through that sieve. I don't know if anyone pans for gold like that anymore. Um, we want many, many ideas. We want radical divergence before we begin to converge. We get better products, better solutions, better services that way. Um, so that's mindset, skills. We're gonna talk about five skills for innovation. These are taken from Clayton Christensen at Al, uh, who, who just passed away last year. Um, uh, innovate, the innovators DNA. These are not necessarily skills that we would think of as strictly uh, design skills, but they are skills that designers depend on to do their work. And they are like this, observation questioning. I mean, we've already talked a little bit about this. What does it mean to be good at observing? What does it mean to be good at asking questions? Um, we understand or we know from our, our work together already, from our time together already, that we spend a tremendous amount of time during design just trying to understand what is the problem? What, what is really going on here? Uh, how do people feel about this? What are their pain points? What are their needs? What is the system uh, that they find themselves in? What are the relationships within those systems? And so much of our ability to do that sensing 
demands that we are good at making observations and not just making observations, but making observations without introducing interpretation, without introducing bias and asking good questions. And that both takes the form of actually asking, you know, verbalizing, formulating good probing and formative questions, but also having a stance or a disposition of asking questions, of not being satisfied with what is presented to us, of wanting to dive, you know, um, not just use this photo as a window, but use it as a door to enter the problem space and to look around, of having a stance of curiosity. Um, our second bit is empathy. I know I, I, I have to acknowledge this is where so often we as development practitioners get tripped up. When someone came to me first, you know, in 2007 or eight from the design space and was like, uh, you gotta have empathy. I'm like, I work, you're, you work in a for-profit. I work for, I'm, I'm, I'm a UNICEF student. I'm an educator. I work for, uh, of course I have empathy. What I learned over time is that I had what is called effective empathy. And what designers employ is what's called cognitive empathy. And if I ever do a PhD, which is probably right around the corner, I'm probably gonna study this and how it interacts with design. That's how important I think this is. Effective empathy is empathy of the heart. It means that I feel as you feel. And it is easier to feel uh, empathy for people that we already love, for people that we already care about and feel close to. And of course, as development practitioners and humanitarians, we care about the people with and for whom we work, right? We feel effective empathy for them. We care about them. But cognitive empathy, the type of empathy that designers also employ, right? is empathy used as a tool. It is my ability to imagine what it's like to be another person, not just feel as they feel, but to inhabit their space. And where I feel, where I personally, I wanna share just a story, where I've often been tripped up and have to remind myself and ground myself in this distinction between effective and cognitive empathy is in solving ugly problems. So one of the problems that I've worked with uh, in the past was um, uh, uh, fathers who would disinherit their girl children. Uh, they, would, they would only leave uh, in their inheritance to, to male children, despite that being illegal, right? Um, in, and this was, in this case, this was in, a lot of my examples today are from Kosovo. Uh, this was in uh, uh, Western Kosovo. So if I'm going to solve this problem, now I don't agree, I hope it goes without saying, but I wanna say it with the, in an emotional way, with the decisions that these fathers who are disinheriting their girl children make, right? I don't agree with the way that they express favoritism and bias toward their male children. But if I'm going to address this issue, I still need to imagine what it's like, not just understand, right? Not, not step back and look at that father as an individual, but I need to imagine what it's like to be that father and look out at the world. That's a hard thing to do because I don't have effective empathy for that father who's saying, my girl child is not worthy of inheriting my property, right? Only her brothers are. But I, if I'm going to solve that problem, if I'm gonna change that, I need to be able to see the world as he sees the world. And that skill, and it is a skill, part of just to, to sometimes swallow your disgust, but other times to actually you know, activate the ability to stand in someone else's position and look at the world as if you were them, right? That is a skill. And that is a skill that you can uh, develop. It is a skill that connects to the mindset or the disposition of, of empathy, or pardon, of, uh, of uh, being human-centered. But human-centeredness in this case means not 
center humans as the subject of our research, not look at them at the end of our telescope or our microscope, but actually stand in their place and look out at the world. And I cannot emphasize this enough. This is one of the most critical skills. The application of empathy is a tool that designers employ. Our next skill, associating and reframing. The skill that design, of the many skills that designers most often employ, this you see across the, uh, the, the, the phases, the ability to make connections and synthesize, associate disparate, associate disparate concepts and draw out insights from those concepts. And at the same time, a similar mental exercise <clears throat> is not just the ability to bring things together to make connections, but the ability to sort of move mentally around uh, those connections and see things from a different perspective to reframe. The example that I used here, I, uh, uh, and I, I, I use this very often, when you look at this picture, what do you see? I mean, everyone has probably seen this before, but some folks see a candlestick, but look again. You, now you see a, a person or two people facing one another. And depending on uh, what, what I like about this small little optical illusion here is that it reminds us that there are several ways of looking at a problem. And one of the multitude skills that makes for a valuable designer is the ability to look at a problem from a different perspective, to frame it in a different way. Uh, we were doing work again, uh, this is a Kosovo example, on, um, what were we doing work on? Oh, we were doing work on, on uh, combating uh, uh, fake news, uh, effectively fake news. This was before fake news was a term, um, but we were concerned with the uh, types of um, untoward information young people were encountering online in, in Kosovo. Uh, we were concerned with radicalization and we wanted to act uh, as, as the UN system and government partners and local NGOs. We thought, okay, we need to act on the producers of this information. And the most valuable insight or the most valuable reframing that we had there uh, was not a need to act on the producer. We need to sh shut them down. We need, we need to uh, turn their accounts off. We probably need to do those things as well. But what we actually needed to do was work on the demand. We realized that there was an opportunity to eliminate the, the motive that uh, producers of kind of fake news had in the first place by working on the demand side, by increasing people's critical media literacy, by giving them some small tips and some little behavioral nudges so that they wouldn't share things that didn't quite feel right. Uh, and ultimately we were able to sort of tamp down that kind of problematic situation of young people spreading fake news, particularly around health issues, um, not by like going off and trying to shut down everyone's Facebook accounts, but just by you know, helping people not, not create demand for this issue. So we reframed, we saw it in a different way. This is one of my favorite photos uh, from all of the work that I have done. This is from Zatari Camp. Um, and this is a prototype of a mobile library. This was mocked up with just an existing bike and um, this triangle bit already existed. And folks are like, look, if I'm gonna have a mobile library that I can ride around the camp, um, we wanna test it. We wanna see if people use it. Uh, we wanna see if it's technically feasible, if it's desirable. Can I ride this thing all day? Will it last? There was a disposition here, uh, a, a manifestation of a bias to action in the form of a prototype of actually just mocking this thing up. We're in a metal shop in Zatari <clears throat> and we have this idea, a local org has this idea of mobile libraries. Instead of thinking endlessly, researching endlessly, let's try it. One quick, it was a day to build it, it used existing materials, and let's see what happens, right? And that disposition to building so that we can measure, so that we can learn, so that we can build better is at the heart of experimentation and the ability to construct, to design and build good experiments is a key uh, skill. Of, of, uh, of the design thinking practitioner. And our last bit here is collaboration. We've talked endlessly already about the, the benefits of both of radical collaboration as a principle, 
um, and uh, but enabling collaboration, being able to facilitate collaboration, being able to bring disparate stakeholders to the table um, uh, is absolutely uh, integral. The, I love this photo. This is one of my favorite pictures of my time leading the Innovations Lab in Kosovo. Uh, this is a few members of the 16 person team, plus actually some external stakeholders. We're debriefing an event. And I realized um, the, the green sticky notes in the middle, not on both sides, were mine. And I was debriefing this event myself to try to learn from the first iteration of this project that would eventually uh, become quite powerful. Um, and I realized like, I only have one, my debrief of this three-day experience is from one very specific perspective. It's from the management perspective. I'm thinking about like, did people come onto all this different, you know, but I'm, I'm only look at it, looking at it, <coughs> pardon, from my lens. And I realized, as, as we often do uh, in this moment, that our picture is going to be more complete the more people that I can bring to the table. <coughs> and so what you, the folks that you see here are uh, the young man in the middle, who's, who's right in the middle, actually a participant in the program. Uh, the, the two women in the background, uh, or, or in the foreground in our case, are, were running the program on site. The two gentlemen that you see there, uh, Yeton on the left and Ermal on the, on the right, um, they didn't attend the event. They weren't part of the event, but we wanted to get a feeling for how the preparation for the event uh, impacted the feeling in the office. Um, what did it mean? Was it, was it viable? Like, was our model still working? And so we brought many, many stakeholders to the table just for this debrief. And it gave us a much more comprehensive picture of, of what was going on. <clears throat> so then there are methods. And I'm actually not going to talk about methods because there are too many. Um, what I will do, however, is uh, after our, our time today, I'm sure that we have a, a registration list. I want to take some of the responses to our, the poll questions. I want to um, uh, take some of your thoughts and questions over the course of our, our time together and I will consolidate those into a resource list. And on that resource list, I'm going to provide to you a few libraries of design methods, um, one from UC Berkeley. Uh, I'll probably also include IDEO, which as much as I hate to include a for-profit, there, there it is. They have a good library of research of, of design methods. Um, there, are, there are so many, there are literally hundreds and they all can be employed just as when we're building a house we use different tools at different moments to accomplish different things. The methods of design get used at different phases um, to solve different small challenges, different small issues, uh, help us progress in different ways. But as I said, there are truly hundreds. Um, and so the best I can do is offer you resources to explore uh, how or what methods fit into our overarching framework and support our overarching principles and skills. Um, so I want to pause here and ask a question about design skills. You know, our, our explanation of skills, it was brief, um, but, you know, again, this is uh, a reflection of, uh, this is a synthesis of some really excellent literature on skills for design and innovation. Um, and I think it's great for us as practitioners to reflect on where we uh, go naturally, what we feel we're strong at, and where we have an opportunity to grow. And so I would love to hear from you all, since we're not doing a poll, we can actually answer both. Um, which is your greatest strength as you see it right now? Which skill do you feel particularly strong and particularly confident in employing? And which is your greatest area for growth? Uh, what might be weaker or much as, what just might be a high priority for your development? Which skill do you think you need to expand in? So let's take, uh, we'll take about two minutes here. And I would be so grateful uh, if you could chat your responses in the, the chat. While we're doing that, while we're responding to our poll question here, if you have any questions about skills, uh, mindsets and methods. I'd love to take some of those questions now.
uh, Josh, it's Mika here. Uh, uh, there was a question earlier on in the in the chat that uh, wasn't addressed yet, and I think cannot find it now. But I remember it was talking about uh, log frames, and uh, and so lots of people who work in the development are quite familiar with the logical frameworks. And then the question was like, how does design thinking correspond with log frames? Like, are they at complete odds at each other or it was around that? Yeah, no. Uh, so I actually came to, that's such an excellent question. I actually came, um, this is strictly anecdotal. I don't know if there is research on this. There should be, it'd be great to see how these two things intersect. Um, my, I, I wanted a way to introduce innovation within the frame or enable, I should say, innovation within the frame of an existing project. I inherited uh, a big project, a uh, multi-million dollar project from um, ADA and EU uh, at UNICEF. And uh, I had been doing design work and, and sort of design uh, as, a, as a practice uh, for a few years prior to that. But what I really wanted was a way to say, okay, my, my objectives will not change. Or let's actually say more like L4, like um, my outcomes will not change. I'm using the UN terminology now. Uh, this would be the step below impact. What I find is that design thinking is actually excellent if you can create space, and, and you can, donors generally are okay with this, particularly this these days, at least in my experience, you can create some flexibility in the activities, in the what you do, right? Um, or I should say uh, at the, at the uh, activity and output level. Oftentimes we can find a little flexibility. If we can't get flexibility at the output level, we can still get flexibility at the activity level. We can be constantly uh, designing, redesigning, iterating upon our activities to make them more effective, more efficient. I can't imagine the donor in the world, now speaking but from the perspective also as a donor occasionally, that isn't going to want to see people change their activities over time as they learn what works well and what uh, doesn't work quite as well. So right there at the activity level, there's always some space to do design work. We can always improve the actual kind of uh, elements of our, our, of our product or services of our interventions. Um, even at then at the, at the, you know, if we already have a log frame in place, we can shift many, many things so long as we remain in pursuit of the same outcomes. And design is actually very good at that. It's very good at saying, um, holding the, the goal of getting my daughter to sleep, right? As, as, uh, as remaining the same, right? Unchanging, my goal is to get my daughter to sleep. How can I shift my understanding of the drivers of that problem or which parts of that problematic ecosystem? And how can I shift my, uh, my activities, the actual what, the, the way in which I'll intervene in that problematic system in order to maintain that outcome? or to, to achieve that outcome. And so there is still, you know, this idea of associating reframing of experimentation, uh, these pieces still fit very nicely in some cases within the log frame approach. And then I think lastly, you know, another last way of approaching log frames is I haven't designed the project yet. It's not even there yet. In which case this fits fabulously, right? Like if I'm gonna, <clears throat> if I'm gonna name an outcome you know, impact remaining the same, your impact of, uh, is usually given to you by your development uh, uh, assistance, uh, cooperation, whatever provider. You have lots of opportunity um, to shift uh, your understanding of what your outcomes need to be, uh, which even part of the system are you gonna work on in the first place? And that, that, that determination can be made um, via the sort of sensing and sense making uh, that design experiment uh, that design excels at. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I uh, just to say, it's not it's not a one hundred percent fit. 
It's sort of about right sizing your application of design thinking for where you have the space and flexibility to, to achieve it. Um, but we can, let's, let's talk, write me on that if you have specific questions. I would love to talk more about that. I think a lot about that question myself. I, I, I've actually, the more design I do, the more fascinated I become with monitoring evaluation and kind of technical design. Um, because I think that, you know, there's an opportunity to do the way, design is it's often about learning and there's an opportunity to change the way we do MEL to learn, to learn, to learn better. Thanks, Joss. Great points there. Uh, very valuable. Um, uh, there's uh, Surenda had also a question here. It's the last one, if you can see it. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, perhaps the most important question. I'm, I'm actually going to, knowing that we have time, yeah, in fact, thank you for asking, because that leads directly into this, this next uh, section. So this all sounds great. And uh, surrender. I want to make, or uh, I want to make sure that we. I am. I am right now about to answer that question. I want to talk about uh, uh, within the frame of our of our of our broader presentation because we only have a few minutes left. Um, oops. Okay. So this all sounds great. Design sounds great. What's the catch? As I see it, there are four, and I'm actually going to skip to two uh, and come back. One of the challenges, one of the limitations of design as I see it, and as I've experienced it, is this question of who gets to be a designer. What's very nice about design, and I, I, there, there's, there is nothing exclusive about design thinking as an approach. There are ways in which design thinking gets uh, implemented exclusively or not inclusively. Um, I actually think that design by providing uh, some methods and providing some stances by saying that there is a way to do this work of creating solutions of understanding problems as possible. Some of the best work that I've done, uh, or I should say most gratifying work that I've done have been co-creative and co-design approaches. Um, and those approaches are saying, look, we're going to not just solve this problem together, we're going to name this problem together. We are going to right size our sense and sense making efforts so that folks who are traditionally excluded from this problem space can be included and have as much at the seat of the table, not just at saying, here's what we want done, which is way down the line, but vitally at saying, this is the problem to be solved at the outset. That project that I'm talking about was called uh, Citizen Science. It was a EU funded or Horizon 2020 funded bit of work between five countries um, where we actually uh, had, uh, before we even engaged in that work, we sat down with members of the Roma community, the Roma Ashkali and Egyptian communities and had a conversation around what problems do you wanna solve in the first place? What should we even go off and apply funding for? And we use design as the way to drive that conversation. Folks that are traditionally, if they are included, they are included in the, you know, the testing, the user testing bit, like, does this work? Do you like this? That kind of thing. But very rarely afforded the opportunity to say, these are the problems that we want you to solve in the first place. And so design was very powerful in that respect. Um, but design can be limiting. Design that is oriented around the designer or in which designers are sort of infatuated with their own role in design can be problematic. Another limitation of design is this question of beginner's mind. Can I ever actually put, can I be a view from nowhere? Can I be entirely objective? I think the way, or am I always going to bring bias or prejudice or, or at least you know, preconceived notions of the problem space into my work? And I think the answer is, it is a lie to imagine that I can ever fully set aside all of my biases. Beginner's mind is actually asking me to not set them aside, but acknowledge them to know that they're there, right? When we looked at that photo earlier today, it wasn't about saying, I don't know what gender this child is. It was about saying, I'm assuming that this ch child is a boy for the following reasons. And I can ask and confirm because I have made space for my preconceptions. And I have tried to exercise self-reflection and consciousness 
of my of my biases of my preconceptions when I enter the problem when I enter the problem space. I think this one is so critical as a limitation of design thinking. Um, design emerges from the private sector, and so at the origin of design, in many ways, is is marketing the tools the approaches. STEM, now they have gone so far beyond marketing as a, it's, it's difficult to even see the starting point, but I think we need to constantly be interrogating the appropriateness of any particular method or approach or even the mindsets, the model itself, whenever we're applying design to social impact, because the people that developed design as a practice, it was enough for them to deliver the feeling of the solved problem to whomever wanted to pay for that feeling, right? There's a big difference between me helping you feel like the problem is solved and me actually delivering a solution with and for you. And design can be used to deliver solutions with and for impacted people, but design can be used to deliver the feeling and only the feeling of a solved problem. Hell, design can be used just to deliver the feeling of a problem. Do you really need a new phone? Do you need a new phone? No but I can use design to make you feel like you need a new phone so that I can solve that problem that I helped you realize you have. And lastly, this question, and we've talked a little bit about this throughout, the idea that human centeredness can be systems blindness. There are ways that we can slice many big problems that encourage us to focus only on the immediate, the individual, the isolated, uh, the explicit needs. And much of human-centered design and its heritage of, of kind of marketing, its, its, its for-profit heritage, would encourage us just to look at how do I solve that individual's problem? How do I deliver that feeling of a problem solved? I think the way in which we as development practitioners can employ design thinking is to orient it toward systems, toward future and emergent problems, toward the implicit uh, problems and drivers of problems. Um, so it is something that we can account for. That's it. Oh wait, last bit, why you should care. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this. This is my own personal story of how we use design. Uh, but just to say that there are many ways in which, uh, this is, this is uh, some pictures of, uh, of a young man, Bouillard, who I got to work with while we developed this initiative using design thinking called Upshift. And Upshift would go on to become, uh, this is a World Bank recognized best practice for you know, youth empowerment, participation, employability, skills for employability. Um, uh, this is a, uh, it's now, we came just from Kosovo scale up to about 40 countries around the world, hundreds of thousands of kids use it. Um, but so much of this came from the application of design, design to innovate, design to reduce risk by experimenting, by building, learning, and building better, by iterating, design to shift power by including people who typically aren't at the table. Uh, and designed to affect systems change, to point our solutions, not just at the immediate, the individual, the explicit, but at the emergent, the uh, systemic, uh, the implicit. And that's it, I promise. Thanks. <laughs> so I wanna take any questions you might have. I know that we don't have much time together. I can stick around for a few minutes or, or really almost as long as you need if you wanna take some time uh, with one another. Um, but I just wanna say thanks Thank you so much for your participation in the chat. I enjoyed this tremendously, albeit, you know, two hours is like a weird time because it's like not enough time to do stuff, but too much time just to talk. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. And I do hope that you'll reach out to me uh, if you have any questions. And I say that as sincerely as possible. This is, this is my first love, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to chat uh, with you about, about this work, about what you're doing. Um, and uh, about your interest in this space. So um, Mika, over to you and, and over to everyone for, for any questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, before going to the questions, I just want to take uh, the opportunity to thank you very much. As you can see in the chat, the, the thanks are already flowing there for a very good reason. This was an excellent, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we are super happy to have, have you done this. Uh, so <laughs> great, thanks. And, and another thanks goes to, as you already mentioned, to Peter and Juguna, our colleague. Uh, without Peter, we wouldn't have had this connection. And uh, 
he, he started talking about Josh, who could possibly give a presentation on this. So here we are. And then thirdly, for all the participants who have stayed uh, two hours listening to this, and, and hopefully we can continue the discussion also then later on to see how do we put these practices and ideas and insights into, into practice in our daily work in the organizations uh, in, in different parts of the world, in different countries. So, but now, as Josh said, uh, there's still time for those who need to leave. Uh, please do so, no problem. This is the end of the official time. And those who still want to stay um, uh, to have a chat, so we'll keep the line on. And uh, you can uh, just raise your hand, uh, use the chat, or just open the mic and uh, start chatting. Uh, I, I like the, the, the point uh, Ari made. <laughs> Uh, hardly understood more than half of this, but was absolutely great. <laughs> so <laughs> so if, if this was the first time you heard about uh, uh, design thinking, there are different kind of uh, concepts and thoughts and rereading re it and re-listening and, and getting your head around it slowly gets deeper. But I think it was uh, super, Super good for, for uh, all practitioners. I'll tell you, if, if you understood more than half, I'm, I'm thrilled. I feel like that's success. I, <laughs> I barely understand more than half of this either. So we're on, we're on the same page. Yeah, indeed. I mean, just, just to additionally, I mean, I'm running a sports charity organization. We do operate in the South and we are considering the how to create something which is sustainable, which can be also income generating activity, what the, where, what, which is completely on the local needs. And then it is used mainly by the youth. And uh, I mean, this, what do you put on the last one over here, like the, the grass photo of grass, we have to go to the grassroots level. So if it works on the grassroots level, it definitely works everywhere. And, and that's the basic thinking, what you do that make it simple. And for those who are not maybe the maybe the sharpest pens uh, in the system so that uh, it definitely works. And thank you anyway for, for this last photo. This was kind of like, now I got the point. I mean, I tried to understand what whatever you said. And indeed, I think I got the point. But basically, the issue is that to make it work in the simplest matter, so then you can expand it and then you can have the second stage of it. And it definitely will work out. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's 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 so much richness and potential complexity to this this work. I I I I've, I feel almost embarrassed in a way in, in how kind of superficial uh, this can be. Um, one of my big critiques of design thinking has been the ways in which uh, this 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 practice has been evolved into a performance that gets sold to our sector. Right, like there are many, many organizations out there, uh, some really big ones. IDEO, who's in some ways the the originator of a lot of this thinking, has turned this into a show, uh, has turned design into an experience, the experience of design, a facsimile of design, um, and in part that's because they they take it to this sort of level of simplification that it loses a lot of the, the meat. You know, you're doing what you do, you're doing the methods, but you don't know why, you don't know what it connects to, you don't know the patterns. And so hopefully today we've had the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, enough of a grounding to at least be, if not yet design practitioners, uh, stronger consumers, stronger, wiser, uh, sharper consumers of design as a, as a service. But yeah, all right, thanks. Yeah, additionally, a bit, bit to that as well. I mean, 90% of our worries are nevertheless useless because we cannot do anything about that. So we wouldn't be just concentrate on the 10% 10, 10 that definitely can change something and, and stop worrying. And this, I think, uh, this is more, more like the, the like the, 
human-centered approach is mm. the, the basic solution to, to this and, and stop worrying instead of concentrating on things where you can have an impact instead of thinking about those uh, negative or uh, impossible issues where you cannot really make any kind of a change. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Jos, can you talk a little bit more about um, something that gets often asked is that when you do experimentation, how can you experiment with people? Is it, isn't that unethical? Or then if, if you are uh, uh, building a space rocket, you cannot uh, embrace failure. I mean, it's dead serious. So yeah. can, can you talk more about that? Nice. Maybe you have heard those earlier. Yeah, no, that's a that's a brilliant question. So um, actually, let's use the example of a rocket. If you're going to build a rocket, do you build the whole rocket? Like if, Mika, you and I get together. We decide to start the um, uh, uh, FUSA, the, the Finnish US Space Agency, right? All right, we, we start a joint space agency. Um, we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna have a go at it. Let's just try to do we build the whole thing at one time and do we launch it and we put people in it or a monkey or whatever and and uh, and see what happens. Um, I'm, my argument's probably not not if we're trying to be say we we probably build a little bit at a time and we probably test a little bit. We're not gonna have a an astronaut test the comfort of the chair for the first time when they're sitting on top of 10,000 pounds of you know, solid booster accelerant. Um, we're gonna have them test the chair here in the room and see how it works. And we're gonna recreate pieces of that experience. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're testing components of it. And then we're probably gonna put those components together and test how those components interact. That's so sort of systems integration period. Experimentation is really about um, <clears throat> If you imagine a two by two, I should probably have a visual for this. I mean, I do somewhere. Um, identifying what are the what are the riskiest assumptions that you're making when you're you know hypothesizing about your 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 intervention, um, breaking those down into their component assumptions, um, and then also identifying which one of those kind of matter the most. So I'm looking at risk and I'm looking at, at priority or, or sort of um, how vital the success of a particular component is. I might wait to test the chair uh, on the rocket ship, but I might test the engine first because I, if, if the engine doesn't work, none of the rest of it works. Uh, it doesn't matter if I build a wonderful astronaut chair. <laughs> that's a technical term, by the way, astronaut chair. I'm sure that's what they call them. Um, but no, I'm, I'm looking at what is my riskiest bit, what is my sort of most mission critical bit, and I'm experimenting, I'm building experiments that test just that component. And then I'm going to say, okay, rocket engine down, what's next? And I'm uh, go from there. Um, so we break our, we break our problems, we, we break our solutions uh, into, into their constituent components, and we identify which components, which assumptions, which hypotheses uh, most are most critical and are most in need of testing. We test those first. As for the ethics, um, we're never testing on someone, period. Uh, if you don't eliminate that from your vocabulary, eliminate that from your mental model, we test with people. And I think one thing that is um, interesting, uh, it's, it's, Completely fascinating. I'll share a little example of this. Um, at CARE, uh, I worked with a, a brilliant guy. His name's Dane Wetchler. He's on my team at CARE. Um, when, we, when we left CARE, um, he ended up moving into the private sector. He works on trans rights issues in, in the US, it's, but it is a private company. We used to bemoan at CARE the ways in which we were afraid of talking to rights holders. As an organization, all the time we were saying, we need to go out and we need to try things with people. We need to invite them in to provide feedback. We need to, and we were terrified of this as an organization. And I think as a as a field, development is strangely uncomfortable with inviting rights holders, stakeholders to be integrally a part of the process. And part of that is participating in testing. 
And Dane and I talked just a few weeks ago. He said uh, that he was getting ready and he's like, we really need to like prototype this and test this new model with the customers who, who are themselves in a vulnerable position. These are, these are trans folks in the US, which can be very uh, challenging place. But you know, it is a, it is a for-profit service. And he's like, I was so anxious that I was gonna have to make this big, long, studious argument about all the reasons that we need to test, that we, that we de-risk, that we actually do more justice to people when we enable them to be part of the process. And it's like, I showed up and I was like, I think we need to run a test. And everyone was just like, yeah, okay, go ahead. And he's like, okay, I guess I don't need like the 50 page slide deck that I built to like convince you of the need to test things. And I think, you know, it is a, it is almost a bit paternalistic um, of, of our sector to imagine that we can't have a relationship with rights holders where they are um, part of, not tested on, but part of shaping the product, the service, the, the intervention, and that we fear that they won't understand that we're testing. Um, I think, forgive the cursing, I think it's kind of a shitty thing that we do, uh, that we imagine uh, that, that folks like can't be with us and can't, can't be part of that process. Um, and, and that's a really long way of saying that we're never testing on, we're testing with. And that is actually, in my estimation, a more just way of shaping an intervention by enabling people to be part of it, by enabling folks to provide not just feedback, but like get in there and tweak it. And at the same time, when we test, we're never testing the whole thing at once. That's a pilot, that's an operational test, that's way down the line. But rather we identify our highest risk and highest priority assumptions, and we test components of our models. Mika, how does that, how does that sound to you? Uh, sounds excellent for both both cases, yeah. That, that's, uh, and it's especially the ethical thing it's so important to explain it. And, and as you said, to understand what what do we really mean? It's not what, like treating uh, people as guinea pigs to our kind of a laboratory experiments, but rather uh, engaging with them as early as possible. And, and that's, that's a completely different angle. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, now, it, it seems that unless uh, there will be more questions, I don't see more others than lots of thank yous in the chat. So then, then we are probably... Um, Ulla is um, having her um, hand up here, but yeah, we I are... Yeah, I raised my hand. Yeah, okay. are, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just one question concerning the, the, the usability. Of the design throughout the project cycle. If I think of the <coughs> think of a standard project or, or program, it has a duration of three years, and uh, easily what happens is that you plan it. You take some method to plan it, and then you find the solution, and then you go into implementation, and then you just implement. Mm -hmm. So, how would you keep that kind of sort of inquiring mind? alive throughout three years? Mm -hmm. uh, so from a, from a principle, I think there's a principle perspective and there's a practical perspective. Um, <clears throat> from the, uh, a principled approach to that is, a, is an orientation toward iteration and acknowledging that even if we only have flexibility to make changes at the activity level, we're still doing that, right? We're still wayfinding, we're still learning uh, in a way that isn't about learning from a midterm evaluation, but building in ways of measuring the uh, whether or not we're on or off track, even ideally daily, right? At the level of each exchange, each interaction with the rights holder. If we're learning and we're reflecting on that learning and we're changing things as a result of that learning, then, then we're iterating, then we're doing, uh, then we're interrogating, then we're doing design in many ways, we're doing design work. Um, practically, uh, I have used in the past, um, and my background is not, my background is education. I'm not a, a, an ICT person. I sort of fell into ICT for D. Um, that said, I have borrowed a lot from the way 
modern companies build software as a service, um, which is an acknowledgement that we're building this software as we're delivering it, we're building it over time. And there are a number of methods, um, roughly all under the umbrella of Agile, if you've heard of Agile, uh, that can be employed in order to stand up this build, measure, learn loop while we're building, while we're continuing to deliver the service, while we're integrating the new uh, sort of what we, what we want to change, what we want to shift, uh, what we want to introduce into that service provision, uh, into, that, into that existing model. And so my recommendation is to explore um, on Twitter, you can take a look at, and I, I, I'm not like a Twitter person, but this person writes predominantly on Twitter because their audience is predominantly on, on Twitter, but they are brilliant full stop. Um, take a look at John Cutler. John Cutler is a brilliant thinker on Agile. Now he works in software, but he thinks about Agile and organization design, agile and strategy, agile and innovation in a way that really is um, uh, agnostic to the, to the actual application. I find his work matters as much for what I do in, in development and do in the nonprofit space as, as what I do in, in when we're building an actual like piece of technology. Um, also, uh, broadly, you, know, you can have a look at the body of thinking around agile um, and the ways in which I, I think we'll, you, you'll really be very interested to discover the ways in which um, Agile as a, as a practice and set of practices, one, map very well to the way we as development practitioners want to do our work, where we're sort of constantly learning and reflecting, but acknowledging that we can't just like stop, like we can't stop delivering. Um, and also, um, and I'll find this in the resource list. I'm going to chat this to myself is I think you'll be very, uh, uh, I'll, I'll include this in the resource list. There's an excellent article about the ways in which agile as a set of practices and principles is a manifestation of a feminist approach to developing solutions. Um, and I am fascinated by this article. I think it's, it really demonstrates the way in which something that comes from software and feels like it should be very icky, right? Uh, maps very well to our principles in the development and, and humanitarian space as well. Is that is that helpful? Am I on the right on the right track? Great. I'll take a I'll take a moderate thumbs up. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Well, entirely feminist. Uh, if we Google it, we'll probably find it. So we'll include it also as a link to the. To the post afterwards, where we'll include the, the slides and also the recording of this, and uh, we'll place this also among in the learning material section of Thing of Power Bank. So I think this is the time to let you have your morning coffee, more of tea, which is your <laughs> biggest need at the moment, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> what I can say, thanks um, on behalf of everybody. Uh, I really, really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. This was uh, really great. Really, really inspiring and, and great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do take care.